When designed in 1936, it was believed that Yamato would be unsinkable. She weighed a massive 72,000 tons and had the thickest armour of any ship constructed. But on the 7th of April 1945, she would face a force she simply wasn't designed to withstand. When briefing Emperor Hirohito on Japan's response to the expected Allied invasion of Okinawa, Japanese military leaders explained that the Imperial Japanese Army was planning extensive air and ground operations. The Emperor then asked, but what about the Navy? What are they doing to assist in the defence of Okinawa? Now that the honour of the Navy had been called into question, the Admiralty felt they had to do something to save face, and so Operation Tenichigo was born. Operation Tenichigo called for the Yamato and her escorts to fight their way to Okinawa, then beach themselves and fight as unsinkable shore batteries until they ran out of ammunition or were destroyed. Any surviving crew members would disembark and fight to the death as infantry against American ground forces. Vice Admiral Ito was given overall command of the Tenichigo operation. He had passionately opposed the mission, believing that it wouldn't get anywhere near Okinawa, and so it has a futile plan, wasteful in human life and fuel. When told that the Emperor was expecting the Navy to make their best efforts to defend Okinawa, he relented. The ship's crew were briefed on the nature of the mission. They were given the choice of not participating in the operation, an option none of them would take. As the sailors finished their shore leave, they said goodbye for the last time to their wives bid farewell to their children. They knew they would never see grow up. At midnight, the ships were fueled. Orders had been given to provide the ships with just enough fuel to reach Okinawa. There would be no coming back from this mission. At four o'clock on the afternoon of 6th of April, Yamato, captained by Rear Admiral Ariga, left Tokoyama Harbour to begin the mission. She was accompanied by a light cruiser and eight destroyers, which would protect Yamato from the threat posed by submarines, which by 1945 filled the seas around Japan. There was hope that her escorts would draw some fire away from Yamato while providing additional anti-aircraft support. To stop the crew dwelling too much on their predicament, officers kept the men busy by holding anti-aircraft and damage control drills. They were barely two hours out of port when an American submarine sighted the fleet as it proceeded south along the coast. The submarine's sighting report, which was transmitted uncoded, was picked up by the radio intercept operator on board the Yamato. As dawn broke the following morning, the weather was overcast with light rain. The fleet intelligence noted that the American submarine Hackleback was still trailing them from the day before, which did nothing to improve the sense of foreboding felt by the senior officers on board the Yamato. Low cloud cover meant that visibility was poor, as early in the morning two mariner reconnaissance aircraft began to shadow the fleet. Just after 10 o'clock, Yamato opened fire with her main battery, using Sanshikidan anti-aircraft shells, 
which forced the mariners back into cloud cover to start of gunnery range. Upon receiving contact reports early on the 7th of April, Vice Admiral Mitcher, who commanded Carrier Task Force 58, began launching nearly 400 aircraft in several waves from nine carriers that were located just east of Okinawa. The aircraft consisted of Hellcat and Corsair fighters, Helldiver bombers, and Avenger torpedo bombers. It was about midday when the air search radar operator on board Yamato noticed a vast aerial armada approaching 63 miles out. Rear Admiral Ariga ordered the fleet to flank speed and prepared to meet the onslaught. The first aircraft to appear over the Yamato were fighters, tasked with clearing the skies of Japanese fighters. It was soon became obvious that the Japanese force had no air cover. American aircraft were thus able to set up for their attack runs without any interference from Japanese aircraft. At 12.34, Yamato opened fire with her 18-inch main batteries using her Shinshikidan anti-aircraft shells and began taking evasive manoeuvres. The Hellcats and Corsair fighters went in first, firing rockets and strafing Yamato's decks, suppressing the anti-aircraft gunners in the hope of throwing fire away from the bombers. Then came the dive bombers, plunging straight down with their thousand pound bombs, which made it hard for the gunners to bring their guns to bear. They scored two non-critical hits. The Avengers mainly attacked from the port side, so that flooding on just one side of the ship would increase the likelihood of the Yamato capsizing. Despite the large number of torpedoes fired at her, she was struck by just one. She took on board 3,000 tons of seawater, which caused a list that was soon rectified by counter flooding. After half an hour break in attacks, another wave of 160 aircraft appeared just after one o'clock. 20 Avengers attacked from the port side, which resulted in three torpedo hits in quick succession, which caused more flooding and an increase in the list to port. Watching the angle indicator at his command post tilting past 15 degrees, the Yamato's captain reached an agonizing decision. The battleship's list to port had become critical. Having already used up all the counter-flooding chambers, he would have to flood the starboard outer engine room. Flooding the space would correct the list, but with insufficient time to evacuate, it meant certain death for 300 men in the starboard engine compartments. Increasing battle damage and having lost half her engine power meant that the Yamato could barely make 10 knots, making her a much easier target. By now, the Yamato had been hit by numerous thousand pound bombs, which had started fires below decks. With most of the damage control parties dead, these were now raging out of control. Another group of Avenger bombers made their attack run, resulting in two more torpedoes slamming into her side, after which she could barely move. Up on the bridge, the alarm warning of critical temperature in the main battery magazines were ringing, but the pumps to flood them had stopped working. By two o'clock, most of her anti-aircraft guns had been silenced and she was dead in the water, 
unable to avoid the bombs and torpedoes coming at her. With the list to port quickly worsening, no way left to stop it, Rear Admiral Ariga had run out of options. With explosions ringing in his ear, he reluctantly gave the order to abandon ship. Fleet Commander Ito officially cancelled the operation, freeing her surviving escorts to try and make it back to Japan. Only four destroyers made it back. Vice Admiral Ito retired to his cabin and was never seen again. Re Admiral Ariga tied himself to the ship's compass so there'd be no way for him to float to the surface. At quarter past two, with Yamato clearly sinking, she was hit by three more torpedoes to help her on the way to the bottom. As Vice Admiral Lito had predicted, the Yamato got nowhere near Okinawa. She was still more than 300 nautical miles away when she went down. Dozens of aircraft buzzed around to witness their handiwork, but the Yamato had one more card to play. As she started to go under, suddenly, without warning, the forward magazines detonated in a massive explosion. The shockwave from the blast downed seven aircraft. The smoke from the blast could be seen from Japan. As the Yamato sank, she took with her over 3,000 souls to the bottom of the ocean. They paid the ultimate price for their living god, Hirohito. The most powerful battleship ever built was no match for the aircraft carrier. This was proof, if any more was needed, that the reign of the battleship was well and truly over. Subscribe and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you don't miss the next video.